first Egyptian pharaohs and iconic pyramids of the ancient city of Memphis. Much later, in 641, the Arab general Amr Abin al-As founded the town of Al-Fustat, the seed from which contemporary Cairo has grown. In 970, a walled city was established to protect its inhabitants from conquering armies. Over the next 400 years, it would grow to become the largest city in all of Africa, Europe, and Asia Minor. With almost half a million people, it was a key link in the lucrative spice trade, allowing it to thrive culturally and intellectually. Some of the earliest institutions of higher learning were established here at this time. The middle of the 14th century saw Cairo reach the pinnacle of its importance. Soon after, though, declines set in as plagues like the Black Death began killing large portions of its population. Then, its spice trade monopoly was broken when Vasco da Gama sailed from Portugal to India, establishing an alternative sea route, undermining Cairo's economic importance. And, while under Turkish control, Cairo was relegated to just another provincial capital within the massive Ottoman Empire. Fast forward to the 1830s, when the urban growth that defines modern Cairo began. Influenced by the renovation of Paris, a European-style city was built to the west of the medieval core. Cairo entered its most rapid period of expansion in the 1950s, triggered by Colonel Nasser's revolution that ended 2,000 years of imperial rule in Egypt. That's when the city began sprawling northward into the fertile Nile River Delta, consuming valuable farmland. This growth was fueled by improvements in transportation and industrialization. Things like flood control allowed the riverfront to be developed, and bridges allowed people to settle on the area's islands and west bank. Just like we've seen with the other cities in this series, Cairo's development eventually reached a point of critical mass where it suddenly became an attractive enough destination that people began arriving faster and faster and in larger and larger numbers. But unfortunately for Cairo, it was unprepared for this influx and couldn't grow fast enough to support them. Many of these newcomers had to make desperate choices about where to live. Today, half a million people live in the City of the Dead, among row after row of tombs. More of Cairo's poor live in a place called Garbage City. Here, 70,000 Kyrenes sort and recycle the 15,000 tons of trash that's created every day in the rest of the city. They actually provide a vital service and were even recognized as one of the most efficient sanitation operations in the whole world. An urban artist named El Said recently undertook a beautification project there and shared what he learned in a TED talk. The Zareb community was the ideal context to raise the topic of perception. We need to question our level of misconception and judgment we can have you know, as a society upon communities based on their difference. The people of Cairo call them the Zabalin, which means the people of the garbage. But ironically, the people of Manchiat Nasser call the people of Cairo the Zabalin. They say they are the ones who produce the garbage, not them, you know? But even if you've got a home in Cairo, it's often built on shaky ground. Developers frequently ignore or bribe their way past rules that limit buildings to a height of six stories because of the oversaturated Nile River Delta land that serves as the city's foundation. This had tragic consequences in 1992 when an earthquake that collapsed numerous residential towers killed more than 600 people. Today, looking around Cairo from above also reveals that nearly all the rooftops are occupied by squatters who've made ramshackle homes on the only open space they could find. One of the ways the government dealt with overcrowding was to build a large subway system modeled after the Paris metro. It now has one billion riders a year and has somewhat eased the brutal traffic congestion, but it brought the unintended consequence of encouraging even more people to move to the city. In response, the Egyptian government has tried to relocate people to gleaming new cities they are continually building on the outskirts of Cairo. But with bad transportation options to and from there, these cities become too expensive to move to and fall flat every time. 22 of these new towns already exist. Designed for millions and millions of residents, they collectively hold a little over 1 million. It seems the excitement and connectivity of urban Cairo will always be more attractive than a life lived in overpriced suburbs further out in the desert. But wealthy developers haven't gotten the message. They're driven by profit and prestige rather than doing what's best for Cairo. 
and Egyptian housing minister Mustafa Madbouli seems to be listening to them. He recently unveiled a $40 billion mega plan to build an entirely new capital east of the city. He argues the project is needed to ease congestion and overcrowding in Cairo. It attempts to follow in the footsteps of other purpose-built capitals we've seen like Islamabad, Brasilia, and Canberra. At 700 square kilometers, it will be as big as Singapore and will aim to house at least 5 million residents. The project was originally led by the Emirati businessman behind the Burj Khalifa, although disagreements forced the Egyptians to turn to Chinese companies instead. This ambitious, risky project has many Egyptians wondering if it's the right way forward. What in capital are they talking about? They should pay more attention to the poor and needy instead. Millions of Egyptians are unemployed and the government wants to spend billions of dollars on a new capital. The new capital city is a late decision. Here in Egypt, I don't know, but those in charge only start thinking after the problem has already happened. Perhaps one of the reasons President el-Sisi is initiating the project has to do with what Cairo has just lived through. In 2011, the world was captivated by the Egyptian revolution when millions took to the street demanding change. First, the 29-year rule of Hosni Mubarak ended. Then, the misguided and brief presidency of Mohamed Morsi was toppled by a coup led by the current president, El Sisi. With a firm grip on power, it makes sense for El Sisi to want to build himself a new capital, safely removed from the masses in Cairo, a city that is now home to nearly one in four Egyptians and is one of the fastest growing places in the world. In the next 30 years, its population is on pace to hit 40 million. One of the factors that's bringing so many people is climate change. While Cairo is removed from the coast, the Egyptian city of Alexandria isn't, and it's already feeling the effects of rising seas. NPR's Jane Araf recently traveled there to tell the story. Egypt is one of the countries most vulnerable to climate change. Eventually, entire neighborhoods could be underwater. The Nile Delta is crucial to Egypt. More than half of its crops are grown in that triangle where the Nile spreads out and drains into the sea. In farmland along the Nile, diesel pumps bring up water from the river for irrigation. Increasingly, seawater is creeping in. A coastline that is continually creeping inland will force more and more people to move to Cairo. This will amplify the pressure Cairo's leaders already feel. But solutions exist to manage its growth. As long as smart ideas prevail and Egypt's precious resources, be they land, water, or money, are used in the most efficient way. In a documentary that's several decades old now, visionary environmental consultant Munir Niamatala made the case that, despite its size, Cairo can thrive. Mega cities really are an opportunity, they're not a burden. We have to look at mega cities as a place where human beings are going to efficiently contribute something to mankind. The world now is not separated by national boundaries and cannot be separated by national boundaries, thank goodness. And that is very much because of megacities. Megacities are playing a very, very, very important role in promoting peaceful coexistence and in making sure that the very important issues that concern our planet, such as environment, are indeed exchanged, attended to, and acted upon. 